A very good evening to you viewers and welcome to this edition of the fourth estate. I am your host Agatha Taire and we are going to be looking at the major stories that have dominated this week and uh, we will start with the story of Rwanda Uganda. We have seen uh, changes, interventions that we thought were coming, this, the tensions, but we have seen that this week, um, I, I think last week over the weekend, the shooting of two Ugandans and the calling off of the meeting that was supposed to happen tomorrow has uh, created a bit of tension and everyone is wondering what is going on. We will also look at the story of the NGOs, the crackdown on NGOs by the Ugandan government. Over 12,000 NGOs are threatened to be, their licenses are threatened to be revoked following a validation exercise that they did not heed to. We will also be looking at the story of students that were denied du during senior six exams, over fees defaults by some schools, and the APRO it has attracted. And if time al allows, we will also look at the rise of Chagulanyi. Honorable Chagulani, the Chad on the East MP, has been named among the Times next 100 influential people ac across the world. And Time does that every year. Time is a magazine in the US that, that profiles rising stars every year that are influencing uh, all sectors, including entertainment, politics, health, science, and, and, and Bob Wine has managed to be not just one of the 100, but he is named among the 16, uh, what's the term? Phenom. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the Extre 16. Extremely talented. Extremely and talented and influential and have been that influential in a short period of time. And yes, we will also briefly touch on the issue of the ICC petition by the people's government led by Dr. Chiza J and the FDC party. And with me to discuss all that and more, uh, journalists and a scholar and I'll start with the scholar Yusuf Serunkuma. Yusuf is a columnist with the Observer and a scholar. You're welcome on the show Yusuf. Thank, thank you. Um, the lady Dikta Asimwe. Dikta is a senior journalist with the East African magazine. Welcome to the show Dikta. And we also have Kenneth Anderson Lukwago. Kenneth is a producer with Radio One. Welcome to the show Kenneth. Um, so so I will start with Yusuf, the scholar and the regional politics mugu on this, <laughs> on this table. Oh, okay. the, the issues of Rwanda and Uganda. We saw the signing of the MOU in Rwanda in August and, and people were hopeful that this would bring to, to an end the tensions that we've seen since early this year. Okay, they came to the fore early this year, they could go way back two, three years. But, but what does this mean that now the meeting that was supposed to happen, these are meetings that were supposed to op operationalize the Rwanda MOU and, and, and the Chigali government has called it off, the one that was supposed to happen tomorrow. Bearing in mind that this meeting was supposed to happen last month on the 16th of October, w what does this mean for the relations of, of the two countries? Well, to begin with, uh, you, you gave me quite a profile as, a, <coughs> as the regional expert. I, st I studied Somalia, basically. I've written my PhD on Somalia. But I have an eye on the region. Oh. So South Sudan, uh, the region basically is very fascinating to me mm. as, as some sort of a, a Ugandan, East African, East scholar. Uh, but you said people were excited when the ha meeting happened in Luanda. I wasn't. And I remember appearing on this show and saying that it, meant, it really did mean so much. It meant so little. I think it was just for PRS sake, but it didn't mean anything. The MOE that was signed in, in Rwanda. There were a couple of revelations, though, stuff like um, we are going to seize supporting forces that are bent on sabotaging a security in either country, which was like some sort of uh, acknowledging that we have been doing so. But beyond that, it didn't really matter much. And I said on this show again that uh, People go to the talking table after an escalation, either an escalation of violence or an escalation of hostilities. Neither of that has happened. And, and if we know that what we're debating in this region is people who are so obsessed on staying to power for too long uh, and with the fear of either of them sabotaging each other, before we reach an escalation, talks are meaningless. Uh, there's a, there's a, fun, a, a fascinating 
uh, uh, essay by a guy called Edward Lutwak on give war a chance. That if you give war a chance and people fight their hearts out, at the end, it's, it's, it's after they've exhausted. If they feel that they fought a lot, it's when they sit down to negotiate. Give War a Chance was an essay written against uh, peacekeeping. So peacekeeping missions go in two places and they end up in stalemates. So I also think that harassing Kagame and Museveni to come to the talking table is denying them a chance to actually exhaust their energies on the battlefield. Are you, are you I'm not advocating really, for war? Well, I'm not advocating for that, but I'm just saying that what we're saying now, because, you know, if you look at the details that we have as, as journalists and scholars, we, we are very scanty on details. The stuff that we see in the public domain is, is just the icing on the cake. Mm. There's so much that we don't know. You read the interview that uh, Museveni gave to Alan Kasuji of the BBC. At that point when you thought Museveni would tell us anything as Ugandans who have a stake in this conflict, he said he was not willing to discuss things that he can privately discuss with the counterpart in Kigali. Mm. All right? So when you look at the, the, the murders that happened uh, inside uh, a Rwandan territory recently, how much do we know of the profiles of these the victims, right? We're told they're businessmen. They're called smugglers. But that's, that's what we are told. How much do we know? What's the difference between a smuggler and a spy? How does the one inch the guy with an average eye, how, how do they know the, the finer details of these, these, these people who were victims, right? So in that, because, you know, in the, in the game of spying, that <coughs> you don't really give people actual details, true identities. You give them fake identities. So how do we know? So in this context, we, we as as analysts and, and journalists, we are going to be caught up in this. And yes. well, besides documenting <coughs> the the damage the standoff has caused, the pain it has caused people living on either side of the border and those also doing business in either country, we don't have so much we can really discuss. So you know the the the, the call that the president of Kigali of Rwanda had uh, at Setaus, the pronouncements. He sounds really scared. Right? He sounds uh, scared uh, or scary. Well, he's scared, not scary. I've, oh. I've never seen Paul Kagame sounding really scared as he was in that meeting that you can even Where see. Where he was his, his warning yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, those destabilizing it, it's, the it's, peace of, of Rwanda. It's, it's a show of if, if a man comes out to threaten violence, it's actually scared. Uh, you, you know, they talk about the, the duck and the hen when the eagle came down to pick, to eat their chick, the chicken. of the, the, the duck did nothing. Mm. And when the, the young eagle went back to the sky, I said, what did the mother do? She did nothing, nothing. Take back those little things. When, you, when, when the eagle picked the, uh, one of the, the, the hen, mother hen made so much noise, we'll eat those ones. So it's fright that makes people issue pron pronouncements of that type. So okay. Kagame really sounded scared. And I think the reasons for that is in the event of war, because, you know, Rwanda is, doesn't have strategic depth. You can easily okay. overrun Rwanda. Before you can reach Kampala, okay. so you know let, let me come the to, scares to should be let, put let in me that come context. to Dikta. Mm. Dikta working for the regional paper and has done stories about this and was the first one to say that that Rwanda MOU was hogwash, like he did. But 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 Dikta, I want to ask you a question from your submission. Who is saying, who is sort of saying there was no escalation? that there had to be an escalation. We can't talk without an escalation. But but but, but what, what do you call an escalation? People have been shot on more than one occasion. You remember the first people that were shot on Ugandan soil? Yeah, right. Yes. W w what month was that? Now, this, on Sunday, just on Sunday, two Ugandans are shot of a smuggling tobacco. You do not think that's something people should be shot for? That's like what we that. are, that's what we so, are so, so, so first of all, uh, uh, Dikta, what, what do you think, don't you think this is an enough escalation? And if so, what other interventions can be done to bring this to an end? Um, I, I don't think you can bring this to an end when Uganda has refused to acknowledge whatever is going on. Um, Uganda? Wha yes, Uganda. Because I, I want to, what Yusuf was saying about Museven refusing to respond, I think it comes from a disdain on the part of our government for its people. Because if you have a border closed and people are being shot, and all you can say is we do not conduct diplomatic affairs in the press, as Uganda has said. It just shows, in my view, it shows a lack of respect for the population because if government is there to serve the people and people are being asked to go without their businesses because if you are a guy who is supposed to ac freely access Rwanda and Uganda and now you're saying 
we, if you go there, you'll even be short. And all your government is willing to sh say is, this is a government matter. You, the people, do not need to know anything. I think that shows a disdain, uh, which, which is not surprising because we see it in, any, on, in other spheres, whether it's increasing tax or bringing parla to parliament laws that people do not agree with. It's, it's a disdain for the population. But let me go a bit on the issue of what, what he was saying about Kagame being scared. There is an easier way to explain his, his fear, if you want to call it that. Some of the people that, the Rwandans that have been shot, including a lady who was, uh, who, who died not long. There was a lady who died when she was coming to get beans. Then in this November, there was also someone else, a Rwandan who was shot, also coming for food. Uh, I think 10 kilograms of, of Irish potato. All that speaks to a Rwanda that just needs Uganda, at least for, to buy food and things like that. And if you are a government and you're forcing your people to remain hungry so that you can f fight a certain war that, uh, in the case of Rwanda, they've explained themselves. They've said it's economic sabotage in the part on the part of Uganda. And uh, also they've said Uganda is, um, is arming or supporting dissidents against Shigari. But even then, if people are hungry, they, it's very hard to be patriotic if you can barely get food to mm. eat. So mm. I think that's an easier explanation for me than um, what he's saying. On the part of, uh, of, 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 of the shooting over the weekend, I was talking to a government official who said, who told me, Rwanda is provoking us into war, but we will not give them that war. And from what I've heard, there is movement of, 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 of trucks, of, of troops to our western borders. From Rwanda? No. Uh, Uganda uh, moving, uh, yes. Moving mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and you know, Dexter, and so that's so why I wanted to ask you a question. You've started by saying Uganda has refused to acknowledge what is going on. Mm. I, I wanted us to tell us what you think is going on. And also, how can it be Uganda's fault that it is the one at fault for refusing to acknowledge? Yet we see the other party no, 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 seemingly no, no, no. The, the, the provocative I'm, one. Here I'm speaking as a Ugandan. As mm. a Ugandan, I deserve, I deserve an, explanation an explanation from my government. And then I can, if I am, if it's a businessman or a border community that depends on, 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 on crossing the border for things, for to buy things or sell things so that families can eat and so on and so forth. I mean, if some, if, if Rwanda is doing something wrong, tell Ugandans so that Ugandans can be behind it. So that even if there is a war, for example, we know what it is we are paying for. But you cannot say, we will not uh, explain this because uh, we don't conduct. Who are you serving? Whose interests are you serving if you do not tell us the, p the stakeholders in this? If you do not tell us what's going on? For me, I'm not saying Uganda is wrong. I'm just saying Uganda is, I'm not saying Uganda is wrong in the sense that in the fight between Uganda and Rwanda. I'm saying Uganda is wrong for ignoring the citizens to whom they should be explaining whatever is going on. Because this thing of, you know, we cannot, uh, we cannot conduct uh, diplomacy in, in the media. That's, that's nonsense, especially when Rwanda has come out to say, this is what we are fighting over. Because whatever you want to say of Kagame as a <coughs> dictator, mm. he has at least pretended to tell us, to tell his people whatever is going on. And then you can defend or say disregard it, but at least you you have an inkling of an inkling of what's going on, okay, and right. I feel like Uganda has not done that. Okay, coming to you, Kenneth. W what do you think the calling off of tomorrow's meeting? What do you think it means for for the progress, if there was any, made since August when when the MOU in Rwanda was signed? Well, um, I don't know if I should believe the explanation that was given by Rwanda as to why the meeting is being called off. Because for starters, like you said, the meeting was supposed to take place here in Kampala on the 16th of oh, last October, month. Yes. Then the explanation that came in then was that uh, people from Angola who are very important for, for this um, meeting, to, meeting happen. to happen were not available. And then the meeting which was supposed to happen tomorrow, um, I'm reading from um, a, a story published by Rwandan Times that actually the Rwandan government says there are officials from Rwanda who will not be available for this meeting. 
to, to, to go ahead. So I, I don't know if I should believe how did you access that explanation? The, the, new times? the New Times is online. I found it on online. I, I could so that means it the media so. no, but even I, 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 were, were unblocked. I, I still read it from there. And but for me, really, w this matter we are we are, we are dealing with a, a a problem of 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 two men, and we are we are paying a price for two leaders who I think should not be in in power as we speak now because. They are both beneficiaries of amending their constitutions to extend their stay in power. You see, when when somebody are you saying they're in power illegally? <laughs> they, they may not be I illegal no, in power it's because illegal. They, it's, it, it, they they actually they are in power in, in bad spirit, if I if I may say so, because um, wh when something tends to overstay, sometimes it becomes a, a problem. When and you overstay, po po welcome, politically, yes. politically, uh, what we are seeing. Uh, the matters of the two states are being treated as private issues. So I, I, I think so? between Uganda and Rwandans as citizens, I don't think we have a problem. I think the problem is between the people who are in leadership. That's why you see um, both of them sometimes making statements that you, you don't really understand. The people in Uganda will tell you we are not going to comment about this thing. And in Rwanda we are seeing statements that keep coming out. It, it, it seems to be... Um, um, an issue between the two, President Museven and the President Paul Kagame. That's what I've heard people say. I also had a chance to speak to a, a Ugandan official who actually says there is nothing much to discuss about this thing. A border was closed. All that needs to happen is to open the border. People want to trade. People want to move uh, across the borders to go and see their relatives the other side and this side. So y y y you realize that there, I there is a, a, a problem between the two and someone was actually telling me that both leaders have tried to undermine each other by supporting the various groups that um fighting to overthrow their respective governments you see the mou in luanda did ca capture that fact that uh, actually um there was need for both sides to stop facilitating groups that were seen as enemies to the respective governments and i think that's something that uh um, President Kagame tries to re-echo in, 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 the, in the video that was making round on social media this week when he actually says there are some of you are here you are working with those people who want to destabilize us and there is going to be a high price to pay. Now the high price to pay unfortunately will be for the citizens because um, I'm sure if there is war uh, between Uganda and Rwanda the, the citizens are the ones who are going to suffer because these leaders have options. They can even run out of the, their respective countries and take refuge in, in, in other places. They are also protected. So I think it's important for these leaders to, to realize that the relations between the two countries um, should actually be about the people, not themselves uh, as the two mm -hmm. people. And it's very important for them to <coughs> reopen the border. If the border was reopened today and trade resumes, I, I don't think there would be such a very big problem. And for on the side of politics, I think they also need to realize that probably they have overstayed and they need to create space for mm -hmm. other people who have different perspectives in terms of uh, leadership and probably relations to emerge. Because you have two people who are almost cut from the same cloth going at each other. They have a history. We even might not know why they are fighting. Mm. Mm. Okay, so I, I, I want to come back to you, Yusuf, who was talking about giving war a chance. Yeah. Uh, President Kagame especially, while, while President Museven has remained largely silent on the issue, President Kagame has sounded these uh, Quite war drums, uh, scary war threats drums, yeah. uh, from the start. Scary of, but but, but we, for, f to be fair, we, we are not sure who he was talking about. He did not name Uganda, but he talks about people that want to destabilize uh, the security of Rwanda. Mm. What does that mean for this the spirit of reconciliation like how can you be on the one hand wanting to reconcile and dip and use diplomacy while on the other you see it in every forum uh, or stand to speak and talk about uh, people that will pay a huge price that will be messed up big time o what does this mean for the regional peace so president kagame was addressing <coughs> two audiences one of the audiences is local and the other is foreign so for the local audience that's when he brings a thing called genocide to say that uh, you're playing genocide so that you can bring back a past that we left behind. 
Now, what has happened in that, uh, uh, when he says stuff like that, that's what we call, you, you, he has securitized democratic space. Like, political negotiation is securitized. So you cannot s do A, B, C, D. You can't play this game because it's a security issue, right? So the securitization of, of a political uh, a negotiation, the securitization of, of, of media work, the securitization of research, the securitization of NGO work, the securitization of activism is what we're saying in Kigali. So he was addressing that constituency, basically to say, I am staying here forever, and whoever wants to play, we can do what we want to do. We can be repressive under the banner of security. All right, so that was the first audience. The second audience is the foreign audience, and largely speaking, you can put that in context, he was addressing uh, President Seveni, who might be trying to, like, you know, play games, as he said, play games with local uh, Rwandanese who may want to take his government. But I want to say this. See, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Luganda saying that if the one that you used to steal with spends a night in your house, you never sleep because you know that you used to steal together. Now, President Kagame knows, and so does Museveni, that the only people who know how to take out governments is the man on the other side. Even Museveni knows that the man who knows how you can fight a government and take it out is Kagame because we did it together. They fought and took out the government of Milton Obote here, together. They fought together and took out the government in Rwanda. Now, they fought together and, and took, took out, out the one in, 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 yeah, 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 so they know they've been doing this stuff together. <laughs> yeah. So they know the complex of each other. In this country, for example, Museveni is not afraid of those who just talk, talk, talk. Museveni is so super afraid of those that he fought with. That's why you never see them in the public domain. They can't even give a comment. Because you know, if they took us to go to the bush, they know what it means to go to the bush. Right? They know how to fight in, against the government. Dr. with him in the bush, how come he's not afraid we, of them? But those, you know, the, you know he, he was a doctor. He, he, the core that fought, the foot soldiers, the, the junior commanders, I'm is super afraid of them. And I can tell you, he's actually afraid of those two. Just that they've the made veterans. their politics. They've made their politics. Messi and Munta have made their politics, like really the politics of, of, uh, of the city. So Kagame, in his fear, he knows if Museveni put mind to action, if he translated what he feels about Kagame into action, Kagame knows full well that this man can actually overrun my government because he's done so before by overrunning a government here, in his own country, in that country in DRC. All right, so this is why you see these freaks coming from Paul Kagame. And you know, you know for very strategic reasons, I don't disagree slightly with the, with the dictator here who said that, uh, the, the fear is not because they, they'll be fighting against each other. I think the fear is elsewhere. But I think because the, the, his countrymen might go hungry. No, no, no. Because hunger then leads to protests. Then we've seen that in Tunisia and places like that. So, you know, if, yeah, you, if, you, if, you, go, if you go to war, to war, you go to war with a country as small as Rwanda, Uganda may move with their troops to the border. And that will be no war. But a moment they cross from Uganda into Kigali, it will take them an hour to Kigali. Kigali is about 100 kilometers from the border. You got the capital of Uganda is about 500. So the, the distance between these two countries factors into the possibility of war. Mm -hmm. Overrunning with tanks and, 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 and aircraft, overrunning Rwanda when you're best in, in I, I, I don't Rwanda. Know. I don't know how much, uh, how much Yusuf knows about uh, the Rwandan um, military. I don't know. Let me talk about a bit about the war. Um, they will not fight that war in Rwanda or Uganda. Or Uganda. That's what Kagame said. He said, I am warning you. Yes, you but, but you see, mm -hmm. there, there are movements in DRC, in Eastern DRC, which means, uh, because if Uganda is not willing to, to cross into Rwanda straight, then there is a possibility that, because then it's problematic, the but, PR, but, 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 especially if you're in Ghana. But let us not be warmongers also. Well, no, and, and but, but you know what Kagame uh, said was the I, possibility I, I, of going I, to I war. I would like to ask, mm. uh, and uh, troops are already moving. especially the journalists here that have been following this issue, there, there are reports from Rwanda that seem to say that they don't think Uganda is taking these talks very seriously. Because at the first meeting, there are preconditions that are put in place. Um, detained Rwandans in Uganda that either release them or take them through due process, desist from destabilizing each other. All those, they say, there's nothing that has been done, Agatha. especially yeah, apparently Agatha. in the past. Agatha. First, first hold on, Kenneth. So, so my question is, since November, was it? No, September 16th, 
to date? What, what First has of all, let's, let's deal with this issue of Uganda. One minute taking. and then you give yeah. Kenneth before you go for a break. Uh, so what, let's deal with that issue. One, um, the, the, very, the reason they quoted for closing that border, the main reason was those prisoners. Uganda, on the other hand, says these prisoners committed crimes in Uganda, so we have to try them. Uganda has released some people, those they acknowledged might have been arrested and not dealt with properly. But the others, they've said, have crimes. And the precondition from the, the September meeting was that we are, wasn't that we are going to release these people. So what, wha, wha, why process, is what? I think I said. Yeah, but due process in Uganda, as you know, we takes some time whether, <laughs> whether okay. and that's one. But two, uh, what you're saying about about Rwanda being, but you're gonna not taking these things seriously. Um, I don't know, I, I, I think that's unfair because the discussions really, that MOU was never going to be taken seriously. By the time it was signed, relations were in fact worse off than when we closed the border. The two men, President Museven and, and Kagame could barely sit in the same room. And in fact, both of them, you remember that's when President Museven flew almost immediately to to, to Tanzania, yes. they could barely sit in the same room, which, and earlier, because you remember you, have, you had seen them seated together in South Africa, so mm -hmm. it was already worse than when the border was first Ken closed. Kenneth, what do you think before we go for a break? Well, first of all, um, the official reason Rwanda gave for closing the border, we remember it very well, yeah. was the works, that they were doing some works uh, across the other side. So they said uh, it will take some time until they, they open the, door, the, the border. But I think the, the works were already done now. And I think by the time they were done, there was an ex escalation already. It could have been also a cover-up. But also, in the MOU, it it's not mentioned anywhere that um, Uganda ha had released Rwandan de the Rwandan Rwandans who were detained can, can here. Can we get back it, to it, that it point after the break, Kenneth? Okay, um, no problem. Sorry, we have to take a break. But when we come back, we'll conclude on the issue of Rwanda and go to our own problems here mm -hmm. internally, where over 10,000 NGOs are, are out in the cold and, and their fate still hangs in balance. We'll be right back. Welcome back from the break, and we are glad you're still with us. And before we left for the break, Kenneth was still explaining a point about the Rwanda-Uganda issue. So, Kenneth, could, could you, can you conclude your... Well, well Dicta, um, at the time we went for the break, I was actually talking about um, w what you had hinted on, Rwanda making uh, demands. Um, and and uh, you see, what I was trying to say was that the issue of uh, Uganda releasing um, Rwandans who are detained here, seemed to have not been discussed in, in, in Rwanda. Because if you look at the MOU, there was nothing that w was mentioned about that particular incident. But then after the MOU was signed, that's when we saw the state minister in charge of East African Affairs in Rwanda actually saying for us to start engaging on this MOU, Uganda must first of all release the Rwandans who, who are detained. Uh, and that's where the, 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 issue, the, 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 the main issue was. And the Kampala, of course, saying the, the, the particular Rwandans who are in detention had to go through the relevant channels of the law. But uh, it's very shameful, uh, for instance, on the part of President Museven and the, uh, Paul Kagame, both key figures in the East African community region, uh, Kagame being the chairperson of the East African community and President Museven being the one who was uh, selected to fast track the political federation. And, and the one most interested. And the region is commemorating, is it 20 years since it was, um, uh, since it was again kick-started after it, 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 it fell. But if you look at the history of the region, it's also because of suspicion and quarrels between leaders uh, that the region collapsed in, in the first place. So you, you just wonder 
uh, why even the leaders in East Africa, Magufuli, Uhuru Kenyatta, and the others have stayed silent about this thing. Because at the end of the day, it, it impacts on the entire region in terms of trade. Uganda must do trade with Rwanda. For Uganda to do, t for, for Rwandan goods to actually get through the border, there are issues. It's an East African problem, but the region seems to be completely quiet about it. And I don't know how this will play out. Well, um, so, Dikta, what, what do you think this means for well, the, the I community? I can quickly answer the question of why Kenyatta and, uh, and Magufuli and uh, Nkuruziza, if you want, and kill are not uh, involving themselves. Kagame and Seven are the big boys in this region. No one will touch them. So that's like, that explanation is simple. Big, On big in terms of the, the, no, the period they have been in power. That and the, and the stature. Um, so uh, Magufuli and, and Kenyatta might be in charge of bigger economies. But somehow, on, in, on the international stage, the, the two, Seven and Kagame, seem to operate the international scene better than them. Um, and then on the, uh, some time back, I wrote a story about Kagame's, Kagame used to be the fixer. In fact, when he was taking over as uh, ESC chairman, the ESC almost pleaded for Kagame to take over. Because remember, they were having a fight with Burundi. And, Burundi didn't want them to take over, but they pleaded with, with Rwanda to take over because they thought the ESC has, in recent years, has stalled on so many levels, and they thought Kagame would be able to do something. Mm -hmm. Kagame calls, a, around March, I think, he calls a retreat in, uh, in, in Chigali with all ESC ministers to map, up, to map out a plan. And now we are realizing that the, the, his term is ending on November 30th if the summit actually goes on. Act, no, it will go on because I think I've seen a few invites. And Where is the summit? It's going to be in Arusha. And there is nothing that has happened. And uh, remember, the ESC used to have two summits every year, April and, um, April and, 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 and November. We know that April didn't take place, partly maybe because of the delays from last year. But partly, it was partly maybe because of the tensions. Yeah, no, no, actually it was because of the tensions. Because remember, the, 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 te the tensions for Burundi and Rwanda were higher at the time. Remember, there was a summit that was postponed even after heads of state had reached Arusha. And that's because, uh, uh, that's because Burundi did not appear, and then there was no quora quorum to hold that. So it, yes, it was tensions. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't yet the tensions with Uganda, which were in the pipeline, but. But yeah. in the April, they were already there. No, 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 no. I mean, uh, I'm saying, because. They had a summit, I think, in Feb, so April sort of okay. failed. Okay, yeah. I, think, I think we yeah. should move on from this mm -hmm. issue and come back to our politics here. And uh, mainly the politics that, with the suspicion that is ongoing, that everything seems to be directed to 2021 elections, especially the, the, the sanctioning of 12,000 NGOs. These NGOs were asked to validate to update the, their information for the database, the NGO database, but most didn't. And that validation, I think, has been happening for, for the last, I think, it since last year. August? No, since last year. I think the exercise first happened b from November, and it was announced again in August, giving them one month. And now we have only 2,000 NGOs af out of the over 14,000 we had, and everyone is saying that this is the Ugandan government trying to gag NGOs as we run up to 2021. But Yusuf, what, what do you think? It's, it's yes and no. I, uh, yeah. no. I mean, gagging NGOs is the easiest excuse, the easiest response that can come from an activist. But it's also no. Like, NGOs have to really sign up to the laws of this country. They have to be accountable. So that but validation is, is not provided for in the NGO Act that establishes NGOs. Well, if the, there must be justification for it as to why it happened. It can't just happen Ye out yes, of the yes, blue. Yes, the, 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 the reason they gave, which mm. makes a lot of sense, is that these NGOs, the database was last updated under the old Act in the 1880s, I think 89. Mm. Mm. So they were saying, we want to know if all these NGOs that we have are still operating, in what capacity, in what areas. So they asked these NGOs to, and, and the NGOs thought that the Bureau, the NGO, National Bureau for NGOs is, is trying to, to impose on them. And I think that's why most of them didn't take it seriously. But now it is it's biting. Serious. 
But you and I agree with me that there's general concern in the community, in the Ugandan public, that NGOs are really fleecing Ugandans, right? There's general concern, mostly that NGOs are? are fleecing Ugandans, right? They are, they're stealing from Ugandans, basically. Because if you look at them, by the way, also faith-based NGOs How? are under. OK, I'm going to explain. But you know that there's general concern. There should be a c structures of accountability for even those that operate outside government. Because they're interacting with the general public. Yes. And the general public has to be kept, has to be protected. It's the role of the state to protect the general public from being uh, robbed by self-interested groups, mm -hmm. whatever they may be, their good intentions. All right? So that's, that's general. If the government comes up to say you have to validate whatever you're doing, it, there should be a structure of validation. That has to happen. And, and, uh, but also the gagging point stands out. And I don't want to discuss, but I want to say something else. For me, what I find fascinating is that uh, the history of the NGOs is, is, is very crucial to this conversation, that they, they grew out of the rise of rural poverty and a bit of urban poverty. So they're doing things in the area of education, health, uh, public health, uh, so faith. So they're doing things where the government has failed to, to do, all right? Like, you know, you know when, when there's rise in rural poverty, which has a lot to do with the government because poverty is not, is not born, it's just created by the policies at hand. When cooperatives were closed, there was, there was a spike in the number of NGOs that were being registered. And as you know, most of these NGOs uh, spend most of their time uh, responding to calls and faking accountability. All right? They spend most of their good time respond to calls for application and, 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 and uh, making up accountabilities. So, because you know we have this history of uh, rural poverty out of structure adjustment, and now you have a NGOs proliferate. You have, if, if 10,000 NGOs are closed, you have over 10,000 CEOs, perhaps some of the smartest Ugandans in the NGO industry, all right? So, you, for, if you understand this history of their birth, and now it's the government closing in on them, the demand for accountability also becomes government is shooting yourself in the foot. Because what NGOs are doing is because there's a, a vacuum left by the government. It's where NGOs are moving in. Now, if those who are pretending to do the, the work that you should have done as government are being closed in on them, I think there's a bit of a, uh, it's, it's ironical in a way because you're shooting yourself in the foot, mm. you see. But the bigger thing for me is that I am happy, if you call it a crackdown, I think it's not a crackdown, I am happy that over 10,000 who are out of a job now are going to become politically conscious. Because what happened with the rise of NGOs, there is money in the end. You've seen the NGOs, NGO staff? Because air conditioned office, most of the time in hotels, big salary, they are rich and happy. But they claim to be helping Ugandans, but in, under the facade of helping Ugandans, they are making big monies. But they are right? helping Ugandans. I've, that I've, money argued, is I've, argued, I've argued over and over again that NGOs in this country are actually a part of the problem that they've, they kind of stay for anger. When people should be angry about the government failing to give them public health, an NGO moves in, right? Now that they're also out of the job, 10,000 of them, they're now going to see that the, 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 the goodness of a government in place corresponds with their livelihood. Mm -hmm. They have to be aware. And you know, it's funny thing that happened that you have some of your smart Ugandans, instead of being angry about their government failing to do uh, deliver goods and services, they are happy minting money as CEOs of NGOs, all right? So what, what emerges under the circumstance is that they are now going to be angrier with the government, more angrier, angrier than they could ever be. But I here's the other thing that I also find it really fascinating in the sense that the people that IMF and World Bank that killed the cooperatives, which were doing all these things for the rural, rural poor, get, are the ones that are giving NGOs money, all right? I don't know if it's not like some sort of a juxtaposition in the part of the government because, you know, the, the people who are giving money, because the NGO is an industry itself. It's an industry where the giver benefits as more than the given. So the international organizations that are giving money to the state are the same organizations that are giving money to the NGOs. Yeah. So the giver is equally benefiting from this money. But the giver is not only giving money to the NGOs, it's just giving money to the state. Now what we're going to see, we'll have a conversion within the big givers of money, negotiating with the government so that it can re-regulate. Uh, regulate on the ways in which this process was okay. validated. So I, I don't see um, I'll, I'll, the, the, what you call a crackdown right being dicta, really serious. Dicta was smiling mm. when, when you were talking about NGOs fleecing, and, and that's why you said you and I agree. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> just for the record. But so me, they I do want, the thing in the name of Ugandans. So, so, so I want to deal with, because uh, he said yes and no, and then dealt, I think, with. We just 
the no. With the no. Because it's first. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, so uh, I, let me deal quickly with the yes. The yes to what again? Uh, to government. G gagging. Government. Ah, gagging. To the crackdown. The okay. crackdown. Because we've seen uh, government do it with uh, Good Bad uh, Yes. Uh, action we've seen aid. It action aid. We've seen. So uh, the government in Uganda has tried to gag NG those, those NGOs, civil society organizations that they feel are compromising their, their stay in power, if you want. And that's a problem. Now, I also want to say that media and civil society in Uganda have sort of have a problem. Sometimes they make it hard to defend, to defend them because of the way they do business. You have civil society organizations who just, like he said, are busy doctoring uh, accountability. accountability. And like, so, but they know that they do not want to annoy the government because the moment they annoy the government, they will then create problems for themselves, and that's something they do not want. So it's, it's, it's complicated for us, uh, because civil society is not doing the things they are supposed to be doing. They are getting money in our name, in the, name of, in the names of Ugandans. Every once in a while, I go out to the field to cover uh, different projects. And you will find many instances where the same, like they will take you to the same house, uh, same, same house or same project, different NGOs, government agencies, everyone, whether I, I could start naming names, but let me not name names. But big, big organizations, by the way, they, and including government, they, so you go this month, they take you to a certain, let's say in Teso sub-region, they take you to a certain organization growing cassava. You go, you cover that story. You come back, another organization takes you to the same. And you cover that story again. Or do uh, well, you in, <laughs> in, most, in most cases, I'm doing uh, PR. PR. So wow. No, 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 no. Like, you know, government, uh, people advertise. So if it's paid for content. You have to write yeah, it even when you yeah, know Yes, yeah. no, th because then it's paid for content. You uh, missed the discussion on journalists and <laughs> owners. You sh yeah. We should have discussed so, that. So it's, it's paid for content. So then if it's paid for content, I have no right to then inf infuse my journalistic um, curiosity curiosity into this. Mm. But so that's that happened. At, at least it has happened to me more than once. So that's a problem. Mm. Now the other the other problem we have is uh, with NGOs is that they they have been even for for donor the donors that give them money. You'll be in places where donors are trying to help them improve to. A, improve their ability to account that's a problem and then three they are in such a place i was talking some time back to someone who is in charge of uh, who, who plays in the energy sector and he could list for me several things that are wrong with the energy sector but then they are busy doing other things on the side because they do not want to deal with the core problems even if they know them and so that's a problem for both the ugandans and gives government an excuse when they want to close them. And then uh, my very last one, uh, going to speak about the issue of cooperatives that were closed. Uh, I think cooperative, the things that cooperatives did for Ugandans is different from what NGOs do. Mm. That's, uh, uh, my mother was, used to be a cooperative assistant, so I, I have seen a bit of how this works. Cooperatives could get people to come and they speak to them or go to them and tell them what to do, uh, the advice without paying them. These days, if you have a meeting, and NGOs, I think, have promoted this quite heavily, if you have a meeting, you have to pay people for those people to come to, to your come meeting. To the meeting. And to come to benefit. To, yeah, and to come to supposedly benefit from the <coughs> knowledge you're giving them. And that compromises both government and private, and like it compromises everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's, that's a problem. Okay. And yeah. Okay, Kenneth. Um, I have heard you say, yeah. and, and yes, I know you have you have participated <laughs> the in these basically. NGOs, guys. Mm, mm. So, so I want Kenneth to, to 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 tell us what he thinks. Considering we have talked about suspicion here before, mm. mistrust, and we have seen, like Dicta hinted, uh, NGOs that have been closed or raided. How is it a coincidence now that? just one year to 2021, you come up with this whole validation exercise and you, and you enforce it so, so strictly, which rarely happens in Uganda. But well, Kenneth, what do you think? 
first of all, um, <coughs> for me, I, I support the validation exercise because um, what did it entail? It entailed you uh, indicating to the Minister of Internal Affairs, the NGO board, that you still exist, that this is your current address, and you're still doing the same things you are registered to do. So if there is any NGO out there which still exists and they are serious, they have an office, mm. uh, they are still doing what they were registered to do, I don't see any reason why they, they refuse, they, they refuse to, to validate. Oh, but of course there are also other NGOs that have been registered as private companies that have transited from being NGOs to, to private companies. There is also that category. And majority of them could be on this li list of 12,000. I was talking to one NGO executive just before we went on air uh, about that particular fact. And for him, he was saying, my NGO has since transited from being an NGO to a private company. So I, I, I didn't see any reason why I, should I had to go and validate. So there is need also to look at those NGOs that have gone through that transition and whether it is acceptable under the law. Um, and government targeting the NGOs, I really think that if there was something very serious about government targeting the NGOs, we, we, we know the um, most likely suspects. The ones that because are they went and validated. the what ones that e would e you have? the ones exactly the ones that have always been in the in the public domain talking about politics talking about those touchy touchy issues we we, we know they would have probably told them uh, mm, you, we are not renewing your licenses but we have not seen them among the, the those that have not been validated I was at the media center when the the government was releasing the 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 the, the, the figures of what they actually found out and. What shocked us all, we thought the minister was going to come and say, uh, because so-and-so has not been validated, we have now announced that this is um, our status, you no longer qualify to be. So we, we, we tried to look for that list, uh, but it, it took us time to just do the analysis, to see the total number of the NGOs that are originally registered and the number of those that had made the returns. Then we realized that there is <coughs> about 12,000 that uh, the, the minister was saying uh, should not continue, continue to operate because they said financial intelligence authority, RDCs and other authorities should not allow them to, co to continue doing what? Exercising. Um, the NGO sector has also been undertaking its own review under what they call QAM, Quality Assurance Mechanism, where they reward even NGOs that are, are, are doing well. They, it involves them looking at what the NGO is doing, whether the NGOs exist, whether they have been performing according to the terms and the impact they have created. So um, from the perspective of the Uganda National NGO Forum, people have uh, sort of uh, worked with for, for some time. It's an exercise that they are, they are also welcoming. The so NGO Forum, yes. The Uganda National it, NGO yes, Forum yes. Is, is happy about the exercise. And they are the ones that have been pushing for the quality assurance mechanism where NGOs have an internal sort of accountability mechanism to, to, to make sure that they are still really relevant to uh, the main okay. reasons why okay. they came in place. Okay. So in for me, I support the exercise. Yes. A quick one. Mm. Yeah. Um, you see, uh, just like the media, need for registration can be dangerous. It leads to self-censorship. If NGO Forum is doing this, then the government should allow them to do that because then it's self-regulation. If they can do it well, they should allow them to do that because it's self-regulation. Every time you have to do uh, to go to government who you, whom you might criticize at some point, every time you have to go to them for a license to operate, you start rethinking certain things if you have a long-term plan. You s uh, so in the media, it leads to self-censorship. Even for the civil society, it can lead to that. That's all I want. Okay, uh, uh, a quick Yusuf, one. Yes. Uh, you know, the raids on Greece, and maybe Sedu, and there's always a, a, a slight exception to the, the principle. So I can take some of these NGOs as the exception, all right? And I'm also very, not sh we're not lumping both of them together, civil society organizations and NGOs, because the civil society organizations that are really doing activism, which is, which you could be credited. But I want to say this. I said earlier, and I'm going to say this again, that the problem in this country, NGOs are just a part of the problem. They are part of the mess in this country. There is no country 
that improved its, its livelihood, general livelihood, through an, an government against this zero country. They're just yeah. a part of the problem. They're eating money. And they, I mean, Ag yeah. Dicta here asked a question. But it's good how, for how, syndicate how engagement. How come this country, how come this country needed these many NGOs? What are they doing? What's the work of government? I can tell you the mess we have in this country is because these groups, which would be otherwise enlightened Ugandans to be involved in running this country themselves, are instead giving them piecemeal, uh, so some sort of pain relievers, right? They yeah. give you pain relievers and anesthesia, and that's all you, they're doing. They are not solving the problem. I'm actually happy for government. If it be gagging, let's call it that. Because in the effect, if we have just 2,000 NGOs, we have active people who are going to take on government no, seriously I, and then ask for accountability. I actually think mm. NGOs are good for civic okay. engagement, for, for civic education, for look, sensitization. Look, Ugandans have only gotten for, poorer for and badly off uh, throughout 20 years I, of I don't work. think it's because of NGOs, but let's well, go for because a Because it's not that, break. it also tells you they've been doing nothing, basically. <laughs> We've only gotten poorer and our approach has gotten... Let's go for another short worse, break. And right? when we come back, we won't mm. go back to NGOs. We are going to talk about students that were denied to sit for exams. And the uproar, and it's like sort of a catch-22 situation. What do you want schools to do? Let people study and default. But let's come back. Welcome back from the break, and uh, we want to move to the story that uh, attracted a lot of uproar, where students who are supposed to sit for their senior six examinations were denied because they hadn't paid their, their full dues for the school. The school, mainly the school in uh, Iganga, where 16 students couldn't sit for their history and mathematics papers. And, 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 and we saw what happened with UNEB coming, trying to come in and, and the Minister for Education, the Honorable Janet Kataham Seven. And we are asking what can be done because this is not the first time this is happening. You have schools that think you are not paying fees but there's where I will get you to pay fees. And you have students that have worked hard to sit for exams. And so what, how, what, how the, can this be cured? Because the argument is that if they paid registration fees for UNEB, let them sit for that UNEB that they paid for and are entitled to and get other means of, of, of getting your money. But, but how do you think this can be? Let me start with Kenneth now. Oh. Well, um, I remember when the UNEB and the Minister of Education were announcing this round of exams at the Media Center, I, I asked UNEB secretary and, um, about that particular problem because it, it has become perennial where yes. you see uh, pe parents and the students stuck uh, while others are doing exams. So I asked UNEB, UNEB secretary, how do you deal with that kind of situation? Why do we continue seeing this, this kind of problem? And he said for them as UNEB, they, they deal with the schools that have centers, and it, it was a problem of the Minister of Ed Education. So I asked uh, the Honorable uh, Seninde, who was representing the Minister of Education at that press conference, how the minister was planning to deal with this. Because uh, the ministry issues licenses to these schools, then UNEB issues the, the centers for examinations. And the minister was saying, you see, while we issue them licenses, it's not entirely our problem. The problem is with the local government. Local government people are required to ensure that these schools that actually get the licenses exist and do not mistreat the children. So I, I saw a, a situation where there was a blame game over who should actually uh, take, that, accountab that, take yeah. accountability or resolve this particular problem. But this is what I think. Um, it's really very hard uh, for you to explain to the parents that a child is not being allowed to sit the exams because of the parents 50, didn't pay the fees. You don't have you to mean explain. The wait, is wait, the, the parent could be uh, aware, but mm. sitting an exam, especially senior four, 
is a milestone in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Somebody has been paying maybe school fees from senior one to maybe the second term. I, 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 in the senior I, four. The, third, the second term in senior four. Or oh, even just and the then, third And term. then they have a problem with 50,000. Yeah. Seriously, as a, as a school, you should actually reflect on some of the things. And for them sitting, and them sitting the exams should not be the end, the, the end in it. Because at the end of the day, this student ex is expected to come and pick the results mm -hmm. from that school. So, for humanity's sake, since sitting an exam is not is not going to require you to pay an extra amount of money or something like that. Why don't you allow the student to sit uh, okay. and wait at the gate when they are coming for the exams? Probably during no, exams are really now in the field. Wait, yeah. you don't have to go to school. Okay, I'm but you, you, you need you need the academic document. You never give it out. Okay, no, you don't. Let, wait, let you don't. finish his probably point probably and, uh, that student might work hard during their vacation to actually okay. raise raise this fifty thousand. <laughs> Come and I clear it at school and pick their exams. Should start oh. an NGO. It <laughs> should be conditioned on picking exams. No, no, so no, that's no, where I the school... Am, am because because we, are, we are looking at a solution okay. how this thing should be okay, handled. Okay, thank you, because let's, we have let's it hear what Dicta says. So before we go to the whole NGO. itching, can you let Dicta <laughs> finish? So he's, 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 first of all, let me say you never created this problem. So it should be their <laughs> job to, to resolve how? it. How did you never create it? Because people get results on uh, on phones, so they have no reason to go back to the school to pay their dues. And of course, as a society, we have also we are also not trustworthy. Because if you know you owe your school fifty thousand, please go back and pay it. But can you use those results on the phone? To yes, you can. For instance, join another university. secondary yes, school. Yes, you can. I highly doubt. No, 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 not university. But you can join another secondary school. I don't think that. You can. I don't can think it? you can. You can. I don't think. Kenneth, you, you need can. a certificate. Let's go, let's no, you Yusuf can. Who has I, been okay, issued. so let me let me tell you. Me, the school I went to for you secondary went to school. So from your phone? No, 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 no. I I'm too old to have done the phone thing. <laughs> but <laughs> but let me tell you, the school I went to, Valley College in Bushen, parents would come and say, my my child got this results. This is what they like. You don't need because by the by the time even those pass, pass slips come. The, by the time the past slips come, students have already joined the next class. So no, you do not need those results. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. So here's the thing. UNEB should work with schools to come to sort of deal with some of those problems because that's a problem of one, our trust as a society. It's very hard for a, if you lead, lend a Ugandan money or you give them a banja, paying you back becomes a problem. As a society, we need to learn to honor our debts. That's one. Because our this school is, is, yes, this school is a business. You cannot then say, allow them, allow the students to sit. And this problem, by the way, is new because me, uh, there, is a, there is someone I know who like almost didn't pay school fees, but somehow he lost his father along the way, and couldn't, but he still was able to do, do school and do exams. And in the end, paid back in some way. The second alternative that I see is for schools, if, if you come from a certain school, um, go back home, have create, <coughs> a, create something the way you have Makere having former students, uh, Al yeah, yes. alumni paying some money, have a, a, some money in that, in a pocket to deal with if it's 50, if it's 20, and the student actually deserves that money. Like this, the school has has evaluated a school, the school, and maybe other people, the people who will have contributed, some of the people who will have contributed, feel they this student deserves that money and they cannot do without it. Then you can pick from that money and pay it for that student. But I have to okay. say this: people need to learn to. Okay, oh, to, let, let to us hear. Yusuf has been <coughs> itching and calling us humanitarians <laughs> for feeling sorry <laughs> for a student that for the last six years has mm. been reading and wanting to. It's a milestone, like Kenneth said. Yeah. So, so, so what? I hear you, but we're in a free market economy, right? As Dictor said, this is a business. It, it, its name is a school, but it works like a shop. Yeah. It's basically a shop. If you want a kilogram of rice, you don't go there and cry and shed tears and like somebody gives it to you. No. There are bills to pay. It's a school. Besides, there are private public schools. Why don't you go to a public school where they don't pay? Because is, there, are no, there is them? no such thing for you you a public school. It's a private school. So if you are in a, a 
pri a private school is a business run with rules and with costs and with bills to pay. You should pay up. Oh, by the way, I also, my dad used to have school fees troubles, right? He went, you spoke about parents. He would go to the head of the school and negotiate with him. I never had interface with my principal of the school. It was my father who used to do this for me. So if those guys have parents, they should go and negotiate with the school way before the exam even sets in. Way before the exam sets in. So you don't have to blame the school for making sure that my business people pay up if I give them what I have to give them. Then the thing that, oh, we give them certain numbers, it's not a favor. They earned those center numbers. Yeah, you do it's so. not a favor. You don't just go and throw them to any school that you find. It's I a center that you earn. You have it because you earned it, which means you actually pay to have it. You put up good instruction, you put up a laboratory, you put up a, a library. They're the requirements that a school must have so that you're given a center. You earn it. It's not for free. If you NEP wants that is so sympathetic, they're very human. They should start a center of non school school fees paying uh, people who see the exam. Why don't they do that? It's, no, it's a or business, or it's or a shop, people have bills to pay. Look, education. here's the thing. You're feeding, you're feeding students. They you're say things like one chair, one child. Yeah. You could have even borrowed or hired these seats from another school. Oh, good you've and asked, you've asked, you've, you have bills to pay. And now that it's all messy about results, as Dicta said, you can get them over your phone. You don't have to actually go back and pick them. What, what is the thing that will hold you? Besides, if you bring the money a year later, what do I do to the bills that I have to run right now? Will, will there be a, an interest on yeah, it? Yeah, there is also inflation today. Exactly. You know this country, we, we are so obsessed with throwing and I think we have we, we become, we no, 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 And I think that's but why I we hear become, I become I hear you, sympathetic. and that's how I, why I started with it being a catch-22, while I am humanitarian, and mm. I, I, I think it's really, really unfair that, because I, I can imagine, you can we, we would that. stay up all night reading for, for yes. exams. But it's, it's, back, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's not so enough so for the so child. It's not enough, I there must be the, money. I see the dynamic. It's hard I for the it. child. It's hard, yes. but it's not enough. It's, it's hard mm. for the child. But okay. parents need also to take responsibility. Can we move on the school, to our I, next... No, 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 no wait. Because mm. I needed to deal with, uh, there's something I needed to deal but with about Minister of Education. The only contradiction I see with the Minister of Education, just the other day, Mrs. Nseveni went to State House with MPs and they agreed to raise tuition by 300%. This, and now she's tweeting and saying stu schools should not do that. Mm, she's saying the school should be investigated. Yes, oh, should why, be why, investigated. Why, why, why. But why, now, why, if, why. If, if someone cannot sit their exams over 50,000, but this child needs to go to university because, and, and whatever people will say, we have created a situation where the best way to climb up is at least to have a degree on you. If, 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 if they have created this situation where people have to pay 300%, but these are the same people that can barely pay 50,000. Why, why is she, why is she like that? Because now. So she's, so she's crying crocodile tears. Yes, those, those are crocodile tears. We need to admit that we are a poor country and then okay. find solutions to a poor country's problems. Okay. Because so you can't, you can't say, uh, you, you have to increase tuition by 300%, uh, then in another place you're like, no, 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 people can't be stopped yeah. from sitting yeah, exams. Yeah, it's a, a tough situation. One of the biggest Wait. problem is education has also been commercialized, and yeah. uh, that's a problem where it's supposed to be like a service. No, but it's not, that, it's not that no. that guys, a guys, you're wrong on that. Thank uh, you for your uh, suggestions, Kenneth. especially Dicta. Dicta gave I? very, very constructive suggestions. Okay. Let us move Ke to our last Ke topic. Can I now you're starting before, to profile us our contributions as, as <laughs> constructive and non-constructive. <laughs> oh, I want to say this. No, no, you're no, wrong. No, no, it's not commercialism of education, right? It's demand and supply. That's the economy uh, we're no, in. No, no, no. Okay, no, you demand and I supply. No, 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 no. I, when you come to my school, um, move on. I have a price, right? Yusuf, I, I set Yusuf, my tuition. Yusuf. You come when you yeah, know. Yeah, it's also because the government has 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 left certain Let places. And by the way, get out of here. Quick, quickly, quickly. It's it's a conflict of yeah. interest where you have a minister of education who has schools because. Uh, politicians, almost everyone, the policy makers that we have also have schools, have hospitals, have and so on and so forth. It's, it's a problem. It's affecting our policy. So that's like that okay. other thing that we want to briefly, have had to deal briefly with. look at the really issue of uh, Honorable Chagrin being on uh, Times Time Next, 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 hundred. next hundred, yeah. and, and, and And me, my question about that. Okay, our viewers might not know, but I, I, I'll give a quick uh, Time is an American magazine, yeah, yeah, influential yeah, yeah, magazine, that, that, that profiles rising stars, so they call them. 
And I don't know if these are rising stars in America. No, they are global. global. Uh, what I mean is, how do they determine rising stars? Because the question I wanted to ask was, what does this mean for Honorable Chagrani back home? That is there anything tangible we can, wh what can we say has made him a rising star to be even in the first 16 pheno phenomena? Phenoms, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and I will start with you because you are the first one to, to comment and seemingly. Yeah, what, what does it mean? What's the implication of, of him being on, on, on that list? First, I should tell you about a quote per BTEC, right? A quote per BTEC has this book which was published in 1986, six, eight, The Artist, The Ruler. Artist, The Ruler is the title of the book. And from the title, that's the content of the book, that artist is the ruler. The artist informs our consciousness. He informs our, our way of looking at the world, gives us discourse, gives us words to use in our everyday conversation. This is what art does. That when you have a political head on top, the one who's informing the ways in which societies define themselves is the artist. And I think to his credit, uh, Bobby Wine has done so successfully. He's really given Uganda's discourse that every time we discuss an issue of contention, he's been there to give us text and discourse and guidance on how. And the beauty with music as, as, a, as a media is that it's poetic. You easily cram and you go on repeating the same things which the song has put into your head unconsciously. Mm -hmm. This is powerful. And if you're a singer, uh, in history, we found, I, I can re there are quite a number, but I can go over three. Fela in Nigeria, who fought against the government of Sana Bacha. Fela, with his Calcutta Republic, was very instrumental in the fight against Sana Bacha. And he had the run-ins with government, the way Bob Wayne is really fighting, having the run in the government. Like he do be, like he do be with Century. I mean, South Africa and Upper South Africa yes. had plenty of artists who yeah. were really galvanizing and mobilizing their constituencies to rise up against apartheid. And in our time, Bob Wayne has done so successfully, not just against the government of President Museveni, but also other issues in society, uh, HIV, AIDS, uh, domestic violence, uh, domestic uh, men, women relations, Kampala, uh, uh, Kampala's development, uh, yes. uh, madness. So he's been very central. And, and the yardstick is that there is this measurable impact. All right. The, the, when you look at the other guys who are profiled alongside him, are really geeks in their own world. And I think he qualifies to be in that. Because, you know, you, you can take it away from him. Right now, we have a president who is learning from the artist. All right? I was watching a song that Bobby Wine did, I think, sometime back in a dance where he features Bobby Wine and, and, uh, and Mega D and, and himself. And, and, and the president now is recruiting Bobby Wine's former crew to be on his... Uh, now you have fights in Kampala between, between the elite of Kampala and the non-elite of Kampala that are in the NRM, right? The Kusasira, the Butcherman are now taking center stage over the Uhurus and, and Godfrey Nyakanas. I find this really fascinating. This man has just become a man of the ghetto, right? The post I put up recently is because he's been taking lessons from Bob Wan. So if you have a head of state who is seriously taking lessons and paying dearly for them from your resources, this is a guy who qualifies okay. in the next 100. Okay, so Dikta, um, what does this mean for... for, for Mm. Bob Wine's presidential ambitions. My quick, my quick comment would be that um, it's interesting they are naming him now because it kind of makes it difficult when the state is arguing and and they've and and, and African countries argue this a lot neocolonialism. It's it's because yeah, Bob Wine has had an impact before, even with his songs. Even like you listen to his music and you see, but the fact that these guys are taking, uh, they are noticing him now when he's into politics, kind of puts him in a difficult position because then they can argue he's imposed on the people, and that's hard to to debate because if he's no, coming but you, from you have you have the government to blame for that he came into politics and they started harassing him and they started torturing him well, and that earned him no, but, 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 but you see but you see uh, it's not just him that has been harassed we know that op opposition politics in uganda involves harassment he's not the first to be oh. harassed so it i don't know uh, mm -hmm. i think that's my only comment that he he's being opened to uh, ridicule here as uh, uh, a representative for the colonialists. Really? Oh, oh, oh. I think time just recognizes. It doesn't. 
Do yes, you but, but it's a node that we've seen you do one. Y yes, 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 mm. it's a node, but then it's a node how that. Yeah. How that be yeah, that kind of no, 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 because then they'll say, because if it's important that they have recognized him, then uh, it might lead to this. Planet, let's see what Kenneth thinks we are soon getting out of here. Well, this this recognition, I think, is basically because of the background of uh, Chagulani, yes, where he came from, from the ghetto, the success he has enjoyed as an artist and the rumblings that he's causing on the political scene. And to me, uh, it's a, a, a projection of what we perceive him here today and what the, the global world is actually perceiving. If you, if you look at the outpour of support, for instance, he's receiving from the Ugandans in the diaspora and some of the critical voices in, in the West. And then you see uh, the level at which he's being ridiculed here as a somebody who who has a background of smoking uh, ganja. ganja and all those things and, and i always tell people each person has a past each person has a past when you look into their closets there is something out there <coughs> and what we should focus on more is what the person is being today and what they intend to be I in the next level so for me yeah. i was not surprised that uh, he has been singled out uh, because I have seen similar accolades <laughs> in, in other areas and, and therefore for, for the Times publication uh, singling him out as the second Uganda, isn't, isn't he the, first, the second Ugandan to grace the Times because the other person who did was actually General no, Yamin. But even Mwenda, Mwenda I, I, has I, been listed in that mm, thing uh, okay, at some point. Okay, so. okay, maybe, mm. maybe, oh. He's, he's oh. among <coughs> the few who was, was Ugandans who have been listed. So I think uh, we should not take it away from him. He has yes, played yes, his part, and, and maybe going. They have projected, and they have seen maybe going ahead, or it could have an impact. Let's on just see if the, but the, but the, the level of governance. Yeah. We have to appreciate Uganda. this as well. That time recognizes Bobi Wine as an activist, not as a politician. If you look at the 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 pitch they gave below his picture is the pitch about his work as an activist using music to yeah but, poli the but politics has brought him to that position yeah but also his background like kenneth says mm. play pl plays yeah, a big role because what the editor-in-chief of time was saying was that we are shifting from having those with big backgrounds being on the magazine mm. with those that have no establishment to back them and, yeah, and, and which, which is which is even more powerful that you know you you have exactly. a ceo of a company who has who is actually CEO of that company, a big company, right? And then you profile that person. But this is a guy who doesn't have a a, a place to sit and yeah, say yeah, I'm yeah. propelled forward by this infrastructure. Yeah. This is self made. Many of the guys that are doing big in are profile in that. one minute each, can we talk about uh, people's government's petition of to the ICC? One minute. We are getting out of here now. And I'll start with you, Yusuf. Uh, well, I, I <laughs> this is fascinating. I'm going to do something like I'm not signing. <laughs> you're not signing. Say it. Yeah, <laughs> you're not I, signing. Okay. Uh, Why? I, and, and the reasons for this, I've, I've argued elsewhere that I, that if if America and and all the other and the ISIS and everywhere said we're helping Ugandans fight the government of President Museveni, I'll become a soldier and fight alongside President Museveni against any foreign force who want to help us take out President Museveni, because they don't want to. If you are are inviting them to come and help you get rid of a dictator. They are not doing it because they love you so much. They do it because of their interests. So ICC as a body itself is riddled with interest, foreign interests. That the moment they help you get a guy out of office, their interest comes supreme and their interests are never in your favor. Um, I would like to say, I've said here before that the opposition never does anything uh, outside of protests. So I think this is new. I have to recognize that. On what he's saying, mm -hmm. If you have a government that uses the army and police to shoot protesters, to, to, shoot, to stop anyone that's <coughs> doing anything, getting outside support, in my view, is only fair. Because uh, right now, and I think that's part of the problem, we have some of the, we have very many uh, uh, regimes that have stayed so long, partly because of the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and that has led to, like the Cold War used to allow uh, we used to allow certain changes that cannot happen now. So for me, I think the ICC is an idea that the FDC should try. I've seen some people say that the ICC has no appetite for going after another African president. But I think 
actually this is an issue of PR and uh, if enough people sign on mm. then the PR would work okay. and uh, my last one my quick, my, my quick one my quick problems. one easy is thing. that um, like Yusuf has said he might not sign and I, I know a few other el elites won't sign but as we know FDC has always been a party where people just like mm. people outside of the elite support them and if you look at the petition they want 5,000 people by the time I checked they were close to 4,000 4, but it doesn't so matter whether I sign or not okay, all I'm saying are, is that we are winding up it's one of those Kenneth, easy things that Kenneth, our Christian people remark? do they just appear to be doing something it's not significant Kenneth? the Rome mm. statute which establishes the ICC clearly stipulates what kind of crimes the ICC can handle um, I have looked at it and I've also followed the cases that the ICC handles and I don't see the ICC have, having jurisdiction really? about what the FDC is actually petitioning no, about. No, it, it, it does. It does. For instance, the, 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 uh, the Rome Statute talks about uh, genocide, crimes no, against no, humanity. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> where it if you take Kasese, you take where because it, the case of LRA. Let me explain. Let me explain. Let me explain. Mm. If you look at the, the Kasese situation you are talking about is already before the ICC. There was also already a petition taken there by Kiza, Winnie Kiza, and the others, and we have not seen any action. And yeah, but that's the point. Crimes, are, crimes against humanity, genocide, but all those crimes were of yeah, but, by himself. But but so the, the president is the yeah, one the to only, take the only, the only, the only, the only, the only path you I see uh, where the ICC petition, the FDC petition, can stand is when they talk about the crimes of aggression, where it clearly says that if an individual or a, a state uses. Um, Armed forces or something like that to particularly go against. And, the and so I think it will be very difficult for the FDC. No, it won't. To but prove, unfortunately, to prove their case if, 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 if they and have enough people, I don't they think will, so. They will Bo petition. Bottom line, it's one because, of those easy because the petition, the petition is about moving the Guys, prosecutor. We are getting out of here. Unfortunately, we do not have time to, I do not, to, I do to not analyze the Rome Statute. I don't but, think it will happen. But it can. But thank you guys for, for, for showing up happen. for your views. Thank you very much. We thank you, the viewers, for staying up to watch the show. We thank you, production, for bringing to us this show and doing all the preparations. And until next Sunday, have a good night and a good week.